Today, I will be your host. Before we begin our webinar, I will give you the rules in this webinar. Rules in international webinar. One, participants can join using Zoom account, meeting ID 83507380763 with passcode webinar. Two, participants must dress neatly and politely. Three, during the webinar, participants must write their name on the Zoom profile with their full name in accordance with the register name. Four, during the presentation session, participants are expected to turn off or mute the microphone so as not to disturb the speakers and other participants. Five, during the webinar, participants are required to turn on the video features. Six, participants may ask questions after being permitted by the moderator. And seven, e-certificates will be given to participants who take part in the webinar from beginning to the end of the webinar. And also, I would like to inform you to all the distinguished guests, speakers, and participants that the internet connection in Indonesia had a problem since Sunday afternoon. But they said that it's been fixed and it looks like the internet connection is getting better. But if there's a problem with the connection during this webinar, we hope that you could understand. But of course, we hope that this webinar can run smoothly for today. To the esteemed keynote speaker, Professor Dr. Edward Omar Sharif Yarie S.H. Mpung, as Vice Minister of Law and Human Rights, the Vice Rector of Academics at Patimura University, Professor Dr. Freddy Lewakabesi, MPD, Mr. Sean Herman, PhD, at Delhouse University, Department of Pediatrics, Dr. Robin Pierce at Tilburg Institute for Law, Technology and Society. Dean of the Faculty of Law, Patimura University, Dr. Rory J. Akyuan, SH and Pum. Professors at Patimura University, Vice Dean of Student Affairs at Faculty of Law. And to all distinguished guests, speakers, moderators, and participants, and the lectures of Faculty of Law, Patimura University, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Peace be unto you all. Shalom. Om Swastiastu, Nama Buddhaya. Greetings. It is an honor to welcome you to international webinar on COVID-19 vaccine, process agreement, and its restriction on health rights held by Faculty of Law, Patimura University. There are five agendas in this webinar. First, unveiling, singing the national anthem Indonesia Raya, welcoming speech from the Vice Rector of Academics of Patimura University and also opening the show. Three, prayer. Second, keynote speaker, advanced versus agreement of COVID-19 vaccine and its restriction on the right of health from Professor Dr. Edward Omar Sharif Yarie, SHM Pung, as a Vice Minister of Law and Human Rights. Third, plenary speakers. Fourth, call for papers presentation. And fifth, closing. Ladies and gentlemen, now I invite everyone to stand and join us in singing the national anthem Indonesia Raya. Hadirin di sekalian, mohon berdiri untuk...
the seat, please. And now we would like to invite the Vice Rector of Academics at Patimura University on behalf of the Rector of Patimura University who has unable to attend this event. Professor Dr. Freddy Lewakabesi, MPD, to give a welcoming speech before officially opening this event. To Professor okay. Lewakabesi, the time is yours. Okay, thank you, uh, MC. Good morning. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hello. Om Swastiastu, Nabo Budaya. Salam kebajikan, uh, the Honorable Professor Dr. Edward Omar Syarif Hiyari SIM Home, Vice Minister of Law and Human Rights, as a keynote speaker, our invite speaker, Dr. Swam H.E. Herman B.E. LLB LM. PhD, Health Law Institute, School School of Law, Dalhousie University, Halifax, NS. Dr. Robin L. Percy, Senior Law Associate with the Law Center for Health Law and Policy, Biotechnology and Bioethics at Harvard Law School and Kelburg Institute for Law, Technology uh, and Society, Kelburg University, Netherlands, and Dr. Rory J. Akiwen, SIM Home, Dean of uh, Faculty of Law, Patimura University, Ambon, the Honorable Dr. J. G. Tabudi, SIM Home, Vice Rector for General Affairs and Finance of Patimura University, our professor in the Faculty of Law of Patimura University, Vice Dean uh, of Faculty of Law Patimura University, Head and the Law Study Program at the Patimura University, Head of Section of the Faculty, Faculty of Law Patimura University, and educators of the Faculty of Law, Patimura University, and the participant and presenter of this international webinar. Ladies and gentlemen, our praises and gratitude, let us pray to God, the Almighty, for this permission, so that all of us can greater in this Zoom room in the context of an international webinar with title COVID-9 vaccine across agreement and its restriction on health rights. Ladies and gentlemen, as well as know the COVID-19 pandemic has shattered the economy and social joint in various countries in the world. This pandemic can degrade various countries in the world to try to get out of the COVID-19 pandemic crisis by getting the right vaccine for their people. Indonesia as one of the country that has badly affected by the global COVID-19 pandemic releases the independent mitigation to tackle this pandemic will not have any significance because the availability to tools in Indonesian ability to deal with national health problem is still not optimal. It requires the involvement of all parties, but domestic and international, to deal with the spread of COVID-19. 
one of leading for taking by countries is to or of overcome uh, of current COVID-19 pandemic is to establish cooperation in the form to agreement between countries with vaccine companies in order to open that vaccine stock and meet the need of both countries. In terms of quantity and quality of vaccine because actually the most essential effort and all of our hard work today is to save and live of the world community from the COVID-19 pandemic outbreak. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, I would like to express our gratitude to Honorable Professor Dr. Edward Omar Sharif Yari, SIM Home, Vice Minister for Law and Human Rights Republic Indonesia, as the keynote speaker who has willing to participate in international webinar in the midst of his busy schedule. Furthermore, we also cover our same appreciation to our invited speaker, Mr. Sao H. E. Harmon, B. E. L. L. B. L. L. M. P. H. D. Dr. Robin L. Piercy and Dr. Rolly J. Akiwen SIM Home who give their time to the flow through an idea for this international webinar. We also do not forget to express to gratitude and high appreciation to the presence and participant of the international webinar for their participant in provide input and building constructive discussion in today international webinar. Let's start with this little step combining our talk and ID to find the best solution for humanity. Ladies and gentlemen, along with participation and presenters of the international webinar. Before ending this speak, I hope this international webinar can produce intelligent and quality recommendation that can be used as solution in vaccine uh, uh, procurement, agreement, and their destination for the world community so all people can avoid the spread of COVID-19 pandemic. Finally, hoping for the grace and guidance of Almighty God, I am, I am officially opening the international webinar with the topic COVID-19 vaccine for both agreement and restriction on the right to health. May God bless you all. Thank you for all your attention. Enjoy the webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Lobakabesi, for the welcoming speech and officially opening this event. And now I invite Miss Madeline to lead us in prayer this morning. She will pray as a Christian, so for other participants with different religions or beliefs, please pray according it. To Miss Madeline, the time is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, before we start our event today, let us pray. Prayer began. Dear God, before we start our international webinar event today, we want to thank you for your kindness and your protection that we can live another day. God, we want to ask for your guidance and your blessing upon all of us so that we can participate from the beginning to the end. God, 
May you bless our speakers and all people who are involved in, their, in this international webinar event. May you bless everything so it can run smoothly. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Ms. Madeline, for leading us in prayer this morning. And now, ladies and gentlemen, moving into our next agenda, it is now my deep pleasure to introduce the Vice Minister of Law and Human Rights, Professor Dr. Edward Omar Sharif Hiarie, as Ha and Hum, as our keynote speaker to deliver his keynote speech. And after deliver his speech, we will have a photo session with Professor Hiarie. To Professor Hiarie, the time is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Master of Ceremony. Distinguished uh, Professor Lewa Kabesi, Vice Rector for uh, Academic Affairs. Uh, distinguished Dr. Rory Akuen, Dean of Faculty of Law, Universitas Patimura, and the uh, speakers and uh, all participants webinar today. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Shalom. Om Swastiastu Namo Buddhaya. As we are entering the second year of the COVID-19 pandemic, our major challenge has been shifted globally from states measures to treating and containing the disease to the massive effort in including vaccine as widely as possible. The issues of vaccine, distribution, inequality, lack of access to vaccine, misinformation surrounding the safety of vaccination, up to the various anti-vaccination campaign have become major threat in our public discourse since the massive vaccination program commenced early this year. As many other public policy, during this hardship of COVID-19 pandemic, the vaccination plan may not be as unchallenging as it seems. Governments around the globe have been trying to distribute the vaccine equally, giving special treatment for least income and developing countries. Whether it is under the framework of bilateral, regional, and even international arrangement. The vaccine itself is deemed as a matter of the common good, with public safety and health rely upon. Immersed in the wide gap of vaccination rate, especially between rich and poor country, human rights discourse nevertheless has been instrumental for us in understanding and generating a common ground in this current impediment. In this respect, I would like to highlight three aspects based on the statement issued by the Committee on Economy, Social and Culture Rights pertaining vaccination and the right to the health. First, the Committee state that access to vaccine against COVID-19 that is safe effective and based on the best scientific development is an essential component of the right of everyone to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health and the right of the everyone to enjoy the benefit of scientific progress and its application. This human rights law protect it right for access to vaccine to stay to take all the necessary measures as a matter of priority available resources to guarantee all persons access to vaccine against COVID-19 without any discrimination. Human rights law also concerned with the international dimension of vaccination, given many states worldwide do not produce vaccine themselves. It is thus the duty of state to ensure access to vaccine against COVID-19 wherever needed, 
including by using their voting right as members of different international institutional and organization and regional integration organization. As we can see, the law does not only impose obligation upon state per se, rather using international organization to also contribute to the achievement of universal and equitable access to vaccine and refrain from taking measures to abstract this goal. Second, is the relationship between intellectual property and human right. The committee encapsulate that most of the vaccine approved are subject to an intellectual property rights regime. It is fair that the private business entity or public research institution that create the vaccine albeit with high financial support from public fund, receive reasonable compensation for their investment and research. At this point, we come up to another factor that contribute to the ongoing discourses of global vaccination. That is the economy value of vaccine. However, the committee proceeds to recall that intellectual property rights are not a human right, but a social product having a social function. Consequently, state party have a duty to prevent intellectual property and patent legal regime from undermining the enjoyment of economy, social and cultural rights. A state in the World Trade Organization Declaration on the trade related trips agreement and public health, the intellectual property regime should be interpreted and implemented in a manner supportive of the duty of state to protect public health. This is certainly a weak, wake up call for the long established comprehension about the individual of right and property. The current situation summon of the togetherness and solidarity in order to succeed and ensuring public health and safety globally. Lastly, as vaccine has mostly been produced by business entity, the production and distribution of vaccine recall for the importance of human rights based business practice. As part of public discourses, business and human rights has been forcing in Indonesia an effort to translate the United Guiding Principle into policy has been relative pervasive. Viewing the urgent need to consider business role and the current faction effort, the community depicts that business entity, including pharmaceutical company, have the obligation at a minimum to respect covenant right. They have specific responsibilities regarding the realization of the right to health, including in relation to access to medicine and vaccine. In particular, pharmaceutical company, including innovator, generic, and biotechnology companies have human rights responsibility with regard to access to medicine compressing active pharmaceutical ingredients, diagnosis tools, vaccine, biopharmaceuticals, and other related healthcare technologies. Thus, we can see the business entity should also refrain from invoking intellectual property rights in a manner that is consistent with the right of every person to access and a safe and effective vaccine against COVID-19, or the right to state to exercise the flexibility of the TRIPS agreement. It is the time for business enterprise to develop human rights due diligence to ensure that all FASA in their activity comply with the global effort to provide equal vaccine. It is quite apparent the issue of globally 
quality of vaccination is a resultant of competing factor, not only dealing with public health versus economic interest. The idea of equality also summon the role of international organization and any other agreements. Business enterprise and the population themselves to work hand in hand in pursuing a global solidarity and resilience. Thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Shalom Om Santi 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 Om Namo Buddhaya. Thank you so much, Prof, for the keynote speech. And now we are in the photo session with Prof Yan Yu. So I would like to invite all participants to turn on the video. And then we will have a photo session with Prof Yan Yu. Bagi Bapak Ibu sekalian, diharapkan untuk dapat menyalakan videonya. Karena kita akan ada dalam sesi foto bersama dengan Prof Yan Yu. Dalam hitungan ketiga ya Bapak Ibu. One, two, three. Oke, okay, next. One, two, three. Satu slide lagi. One, Two, three. Okay, thank you so much, Prof, for this morning. We hope that we will have you again in our next events in Faculty of Law, Patimura University. Thank you You're so much, welcome. Prof. Thanks, Parori, Prof Lewakabesi. Thanks, makasih banyak. Makasih, Prof. Sampai jumpa besok di Bye. webinar OJK. Siap, <laughs> makasih. Ya. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, now we will begin the next agenda, the plenary session, and it will be led by our moderator, Miss Maria Agnes Matakena, SH. Maria Agnes Matakena was a student at Faculty of Law, Patimura University, with a focus in international law and foreign human rights policy. She recently completed her bachelor thesis depends on the topic of restriction on the enjoyment of the right to health of developing nations based on advanced process agreements of the COVID-19 vaccine by developed nations. We could see that her bachelor thesis is very related to our topic today. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Miss Maria Agnes Matakena SH as our moderator for today. Thank you very much for that, our wonderful MC Quincy. Uh, thank you and good morning everyone for joining us in this plenary session with three very esteemed speakers joining us from different sides of the world, whom I will be very honored to introduce very shortly. They will add on to the topic of our conference today under the theme, Advanced Purchase Agreement of the COVID-19 Vaccine and its Impact on the Right to Health, which Professor Eddie uh, just delivered the uh, material uh, before. So we're very excited to have the fruitful discussion that follows from that. However, before I do um, introduce our wonderful speakers today and allow them to present their material, please allow me to explain the mechanism of this morning's session. For the, this morning's session, there are a few things that I want to uh, convey before that. Our wonderful MC has already delivered the um, guidelines for today's um, webinar, uh, but one of the most main point is that please keep your microphones mute and be respectful in communication throughout the chat to either the speakers or other participants. This is very important in making sure that our session continues smoothly. 
moving on to the rundown of uh, the plenary session this morning. Um, I, this session will be conducted in three parts. Firstly, we will hear the presentation of our three esteemed guests. Secondly, we will follow up with a discussion session, which is a question session uh, where participants will be able to ask questions. However, to keep the, uh, the discussion orderly, we ask that the participants please send their questions in through chat where I will convey it to our esteemed speakers throughout this session. And then lastly, our last, last part of the session is conclusion and closing remarks or statements from our uh, guest speakers. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker for this session. Joining us from Dalhousie University, Canada, Mr. Sean Harmon. He is a lecturer at the School of Law, Dalhousie, teaching in the areas of health, law, and ethics, health innovation regulation uh, regarding stem cells, prosthetics, medicines, devices, public health law and ethics, and human rights, with an emphasis on the disability and cultural practices. He often works at the intersection of law, policy, and ethics, and has a record of interdisciplinary research. Currently, his interests lie in global health and justice, the regulation of health professions, and both life science and medical device innovation regulation. This morning, he will be presenting on the topic of global health justice and vaccine proc procurement, the problem with APAs and the possible solutions and output of the law as a barrier or enabler of immunization projects. To Mr. Sean Harmon, good evening. I assume it is already late in Canada. We really appreciate your uh, presence here at our virtual seminar. And this, despite it is uh, the time inconvenience, um, we are very honored to have you here with us today. So I would like to invite you to deliver your presentation. And I would like to remind you that you have 20 minutes to present. And then 10 minutes we will use as question and answer session at the end of all the speakers. Uh, so to Mr. Sean Harmon, uh, the time and place is yours. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, <clears throat> am I able to uh, share my screen? Yes, uh, I just... think you are the co-host. Okay, okay, can you, is that, uh, is that working for you? Yes, very clear. Okay, and then let me just get it onto a uh, slideshow from the beginning. There we go. Okay, um, right. So I suspect that uh, a lot of the speakers today will will have some overlapping uh, topics and overlapping points of, of view. Uh, I noticed that <clears throat> my talk will already uh, share some ideas with the uh, with that of the keynote speaker. So I think that's uh, I think that's positive. I think that will reinforce some very important points. This is what I'm going to try and get through <clears throat> uh, during my 20 minutes. And my ultimate uh, question is, what's wrong with vaccine procurement from a global health justice perspective? Uh, this is just a quick slide about the project team. So I'm on a project right now that's funded by the Canadian Institute of Health uh, Research. And um, we're looking at governance of immunization in, in Canada. <clears throat> so vaccines. Um, I think we're all aware of the importance of vaccines to public health generally uh, public health interventions and gaining timely access to vaccines as they are needed. Now, of course, access is more critical, more pressing and more difficult during public, public health emergencies when the number of at-risk individuals in any given place will drastically outpace uh, the number of doses that, can, that exist or that can be manufactured in the short term, which makes procurement particularly uh, important. And of course, we've struggled to secure, distribute, and administer uh, relevant vaccines in a timely, effective, and non-discriminatory way, which given our long, long history with uh, infectious disease might seem a bit bewildering and certainly should seem a bit bewildering. So our current context from a rights perspective 
it's pretty nice. Uh, we have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which talks about all humans uh, being born free and equal in dignity and rights. And everyone is entitled to those rights without discrimination. And we have the um, International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, which talks about, uh, as has already been mentioned, the uh, right to enjoy the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. That's open to everybody and that everyone has the right to enjoy the benefits of scientific progress and its applications. And that states have to assist with the diffusion of science and culture through multiple means. And of course, these, these rights, these sentiments are reiterated in international legal and policy instruments again and again, from the, the UN Charter, to the WHO Constitution, the Declaration of Valma Ada, uh, the Ottawa Charter, the Bangkok Charter, the Adelaide Statement, and so on and so on. So the rhetoric of rights is uh, quite strong and quite uniform, but our reality is rather a bit more dismal. And we're confronted with this progressive development of science through private actors, intent on science for profit, knowledge and closure. Uh, our keynote already talked about, about, uh, about trips and about the, uh, the uh, intellectual property uh, problems that arise. Oh, we have unequal everything in the world, really. Uh, so health disparities in particular is what concerns us uh, in the current context. Insufficient capacity in many countries to systematically um, deal with public health emergencies. And then we have uh, a, a retreat from known needs, is how I would describe it. So we need less wealth concentration, but we favor consumption, economic growth, and wealth accumulation. We need greater attention to the social determinants of health, but we concentrate spending on technological innovations in acute care. We need greater data on ill health distribution and its interaction with unequal conditions across the life course, but we do not collect granular data. We need easier access to the benefits of science and essential medicines, but we still create barriers, legal barriers, uh, trade barriers, policy barriers. Now, what we've done with vaccines is we've created a market and it's a rather unique market with some special features, but it's nonetheless a market with uh, high value products that are nonetheless need uh, to be affordable and to enter national and subnational systems capable of handling them. Now, these characteristics have resulted in a small field of pretty sophisticated and powerful manufacturers with pretty reliable uh, financial streams cap uh, and which make them capable of ignoring uh, the needs of jurisdictions with less capacity. So vaccine procurement from a practical point of view typically uh, follows one of four uh, routes. There's self-procurement by states. This is the most common. Um, and uh, it, it depends on the capacity of, of the country to undertake. There are interstate transfers. These are less common, but certainly occurred during the 2009 H1N1 influenza pandemic. And Canada has undertaken some in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, there's procurement and donation by international organizations, and then procurement and administration by international organizations for those uh, countries least able to, to handle the, um, the, the the, who don't have the architecture to, uh, to distribute and deliver vaccines on their own. And I would argue that there are, are a, a variety of negative consequences of this. First of all, this, what we've created is an, a neoliberal market um, and, a, and, and a contracting approach to, to vaccines. And this advances and fortifies an innovation and a distribution structure that's driven by commodification and commercialization supply and demand sensibilities and enclosure of scientific and commercial knowledge. And it advocates as benign and acceptable that there are highly variable abilities to pay, variable prices, discreetly negotiated and veiled arrangements, and ultimately inaccessibility to essential medicines. So under this paradigm, there are a number of, of uh, consequences of this. And, and the one I would point to in particular in this talk is is the third bullet uh, in red uh, that um, such manufacturing surge capacity as exists is often monopolized by high income countries capable of affording uh, APAs, which are contracts between a manufacturer and a government which lays dormant until triggered 
by a predetermined event at which state becomes legally binding. So the health disparities that our international uh, legal and policy regime, at least in the human rights context, is meant uh, to deal with goes unaddressed and in fact is accentuated. And in the next four slides, I talk about four particular consequences of, of a, APAs. One is that um, typically there's, uh, a payments are made even in the, in the dormant phase by states. They pay annual pandemic preparedness fees. So these fees essentially cover access to a vaccine that may never be needed during the life of the contract. And so entering into these contracts and paying these fees is obviously prohibitive to certain countries. Even with the uh, concession that some, not all, but some uh, manufacturers have, have entered into, they're still not necessarily accept, uh, accessible. And that means that some countries don't have the safety net that uh, APAs may represent. Next. Uh, Disease burden has not necessarily uh, entered, been a driver of, of vaccine access So, in relation to APAs. So there's no or, or little correlation between the maintenance of an APA and the actual disease burden and need. And this was demonstrated again in, in the 2009 H1N1 pandemic. Now, in some cases, if a country doesn't need as many vaccines as its minimum uh, amount uh, when a contract is triggered, they can sometimes uh, forego buying those or they can ship, ship them on. But again, this will depend on the negotiating power of uh, that, that country. Uneven negotiating power. Uh, so APAs can address vaccine doses for existing strains, emerging strains, uh, unknown strains. And in the event that a state's needs are less than the minimum number of vaccines available, they may be able to reduce their purchase, but again, they may not be able to do so. And finally, lack of transparency. Um, the, the, both the fees, but also the, the content and the specific provisions of APAs are rarely publicized. Um, and they're very hard to get a hold of. And this absence of transparency profoundly undermines the ability of countries to make informed decisions about APAs, to ensure fair treatment by manufacturers or to develop capacity that might enhance their negotiating power. And it represents, I think, a clear effort by manufacturers to secure market advantages, uh, contrary to rights of access to scientific progress and to access, rights of access to essential medicines. So at root, the problem is that vaccines are treated as if they were sneakers or rolled steel or tires or t-shirts. They're just common commodities. And my argument is that, uh, in some later slides, is that they're not actually some, they're not common commodities. So if we think about APAs in Canada, um, you'll see this quote, I won't, I won't read it out. But Canada was meant to was intending to pursue uh, vigorously the purchase of COVID-19 vaccines. This was an announcement made in August 2020. By July 2021, a year later, uh, they the government uh, released the news release uh, after a summer of intense negotiations. We've uh, got advanced purchase agreements with seven manufacturers and had bought more doses per capita than any other country. Um, ultimately, uh, through APAs, Canada had uh, secured access to 414 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines for a population of 37.6 million people, some of whom would be ineligible for vaccination because of age, infirmity, immune suppression, or whatever. Uh, some 72 million have been actually delivered. Um, by July 2021, uh, about 71% of the Canadian population had been vaccinated. Vaccination was slowing down. We've got some uh, vaccines stockpiled and another uh, 60 million on order. Uh, now Canada, you know, ha has donated uh, both money and vaccines through the COVAX program, but um, you can see the, the significance that APAs have, has had on Canada's attempt to respond 
to the COVID-19 pandemic and with uh, really not a whole lot of thought, I think, uh, given to the wider global uh, context, uh, which is what uh, this pand pandemic and many other pandemics would require. And so we see coverage rates very uneven across the world and a growing equity gap that's resulting in a two-tier recovery profile. So we've got a rhetoric of togetherness, but certainly through the use or deployment of APAs, we in reality have a disparity and we have separation. This is just a quote here from uh, Chag Lam Pai on, on booster doses, which is a, an issue that is now arising with countries like Canada, the US and Germany offering a third doses or booster doses before some countries um, are, are even getting first doses to the majority of their, of their populations. So what's an alternative approach? Again, this was, this was raised uh, in, in keynote speech. And I think it is that, um, that we need to think of vaccines as global public goods. Um, and these are something that once provided can be enjoyed beyond the actual purchaser or consumer. But without a mechanism for collective action, global public, public goods will almost always be underproduced. Um, and, but given the global linkages and mobility that exists, the social convergence, pressure on common global resources, and the fact that all human activity and production relies on human health, I think there's a strong argument made that health is a, a global public good, or at a minimum, at least, the foundations of good health should be approached as global public goods, access to which should not be restricted by market conditions and commercial sensibilities. And I think vaccines are surely an example of such a foundational good relating to health. And uh, this characterization as a public good is, is further justified by the, uh, by the bullets that I've listed there, one of which is the, the significant amounts of public funding that has gone into um, both infectious disease research, but also COVID-19 vaccine research. Uh, curiously, this additional funding um, into the private sector has not been conditioned on imperatives to ensure affordable pricing or equitable access. And we certainly haven't seen equitable access. So what are some solutions? <clears throat> How might we improve access to vaccines and reduce the negative fallout of APAs, particularly during public health emergencies? Um, I'm offering three solutions and I'll try to get through them quite quickly here. The first is in relation to the international health regulations, which are really more about avoiding secrecy around infectious disease, establishing common mechanisms for declaring a public health emergency of international concern, and it's about, it's about trade and traffic. Um, now, despite the rhetoric of, of Article 3, so you compare this to the international law around, and, it, and also, the, you know, the, inter, the international health regulations don't have an enforcement mechanism, which is another problem. And you compare this to the international law around trade, which is clear, strong, monitored, and vigorously enforced, um, which is one of the reasons why APAs have, I think, arisen in the first place. So we might think about how we could change the international health regulations, which is ultimately aimed at infectious disease and could potentially be amended to include a section on vaccine procurement during uh, public health emergencies of international concern. Uh, it could address things like common practices, market evening provisions, critical populations to be served in all jurisdictions implicated before larger rollouts. So these are some things that could be addressed through the international health regulations. Another solution is entirely new international law. Uh, as long ago as 2008, a framework convention on health had been uh, suggested and is probably even more relevant today than it, uh, than it was then and more needed. And it could do things like set global norms and priorities for health systems and essential human needs while offering some countries flexibilities establishing a fund, uh, funding mechanisms, uh, governing the prolifer pr proliferating number of actors. The health scene is quite a crowded space these days, and not just with uh, uh, operators who are concerned primarily with health, but with many who are primarily concerned with trade. 
Obviously, this would take a lot of political will and extensive work um, and not a small amount of um, money. But as we enter um, a period where we expect to see more uh, pandemics and more uh, health uh, impacting climate related problems, this is probably something that's more pressing than, than ever. And a final solution is a range of programmatic solutions. So countries need to establish NITAGs, um, which are expertly staffed. These NITAGs need to develop uh, multi-year uh, vaccine plans, vaccine procurement plans, but with procurement approached as a strategic action and not an administrative support function, which is how procurement is often approached. And a well-balanced vaccine ecosystem with appropriate budget allocated to vaccination. Uh, I, in a lot of countries, Canada included, um, vaccines are dealt with through public health and the, the budget there is minuscule compared to uh, the drug budgets, which are under a different uh, budget line. Uh, another uh, suggestion is Pooling, uh, countries within a region or sharing epidemi epidemiological characteristics, characteristics could harmonize their processes for regular and emergency assessment of vaccine needs. They could develop joint vaccine demand for routine and emergency settings. In other, in other words, purchasing together. Um, currently discrepancies exist even within small regions. Uh, they need to share, generate uh, uh, evidence and around supplier performance. This is typically not done. They need to develop processes for mutual recognition of product registration, which is again, not done. And common procurement rules would also help. Right now that doesn't happen and that uh, dissuades some uh, manufacturers from, from operating more broadly within the field. And of course, all, all importantly is for a wider variety of actors to develop manufacturing uh, capacity. So um, I think it's obvious the pandemic has not been felt equally around the globe. The usual suspects have leveraged greater resources and capacities to improve their situation. Um, we've relied to a great extent on market approaches to science, market approaches to vaccine development and to access and to delivery. And these have proven inefficient and unfair and procurement of vaccines through APAs entrench these inequalities. And actors need to develop an understanding of a better understanding of vaccines and vaccination as, as global public goods. And I think this will help us reorient how we approach these types of, of emergencies. Uh, it was a bit of a whirlwind, but uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much for that insightful presentation on APAs and the impact it has on the right to health. I think it's uh, fair to point out that there were some very interesting points made about how vaccines that are supposedly made to curb the uh, advancing bad effects of the pandemic somehow is treated as any other goods we find at the market like shoes or handbags and it's it's fair to say that um vaccines have become commodities that are that are easily bought just based on a country's ability to uh, purchase and i think that's a very excellent point made by your in your presentation and to curb this, despite there being a lot of international laws and norms that are present to make sure that the right to health is secured in the international community, we see that um, disparity between countries' ability to fulfill that. And I am very interested in the solutions that you have provided in your um, presentation about how we have to make sure that vaccines are treated more as a public good rather than a commodity or something that can just be bought um, on how you're, you introduce maybe the possibility of new uh, international law that can set global norms and um, principles in 
within the distribution or the procurement of vaccines. And I think the idea of your pragmatic solution, how countries can cooperate together throughout multi-year contracts to um, just to develop and produce vaccines, as well as pooling vaccines together is, and having common rules within the international community for uh, vaccine procurement is very interesting. So I hope that the other participants also find this a very interesting topic to ask about. And so I invite the other participants to send your questions through chat so that we may discuss with um, Mr. Harmon. Um, Mr. Harmon, allow me to maybe translate or uh, give a small conclusion towards our uh, participants who might um, not have caught all what, what you have said. So, um, bagi peserta, mungkin singkat saja, APA atau Advanced Purchase Agreement ini adalah sejenis perjanjian yang digunakan negara-negara untuk memperoleh vaksin dari berbagai perusahaan. Bisa perusahaan dalam negaranya sendiri atau dari negara asing. Um, dan perjanjian ini sering digunakan oleh negara-negara maju. Karena apa? Karena, vaksin, karena APA ini membutuhkan uang yang banyak untuk um, agar agar um, agar uh, perusahaan yang membuat vaksin itu mem dapat memenuhi insentif mereka untuk uh, untuk membuat vaksin tersebut. Nah, permasalahannya sekarang ketika negara maju dapat membeli vaksin dengan jumlah yang banyak, dengan harga yang tinggi, terjadi suatu kesenjangan dengan negara berkembang yang tidak dapat melakukan hal yang sama, tidak dapat memenuhi harga yang standar harga yang sangat tinggi dilakukan oleh negara maju. Oleh karena itu, Pak Harman menawarkan beberapa solusi dalam hukum internasional dalam Uh, bidang internasional bagaimana kita bisa mengatur uh, akses terhadap vaksin supaya tidak lagi menggunakan perjanjiannya saja seperti solusi uh, mem membuat vaksin bukan lagi suatu komoditas tetapi sebagai barang publik umum uh, barang publik uh, yang kedua ada solusi mengenai uh, dasar hukum internasional yang baru yang dapat mengatur akses terhadap vaksin dan yang ketiga ada juga um, pendekatan yang pragmatis yaitu uh, koordinasi antar negara untuk menggabungkan semua vaksin, persediaan vaksin dan kembali lagi didistribusi secara adil. Uh, so I think that's maybe a short conclusion that I can give our other participants who might not have understood the whole context. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sean Harvin, for a very insightful presentation. We, we will you. love to hear from you in the question and answer session. Okay. Following that presentation, uh, I, I will now introduce the second speaker joining us from the Netherlands, Ms. Robin Pierce. She is a lecturer, a senior law associate with the Petrie Form Center for Health Law and Policy, Biotechnology and Bioethics at Harvard Law School. She was formerly on the faculty of Tanish University Delft in the Netherlands, where her work focused on legal, ethical, and policy implications of advances in biotechnology, including policy issues in the integration of nanotechnology in healthcare, regulatory policy, and ethical issues in governance of synthetic biology and policy, legal and ethical issues arising from advances in Alzheimer's disease research and neuroscience. In 2014, Dr. Pierce was appointed Associate Editor of Science and Genetics with the Journal of Bioethical Inquiry. In 2010, she was appointed Program Leader of the Cuba Center Program on Society and Genomics in the Netherlands. She has taught across disciplines, including such courses as remedies, social issues in biology, ethics, legal and social issues in the life sciences, public health ethics, and the development of legal and political institutions. Continuing on from uh, today's overarching theme, which is advanced purchase agreements and its impact on the right to health throughout um, for the COVID-19 vaccines. Um, firstly, from our guest, uh, our keynote speaker and Mr. Ham before this, uh, Ms. Peace, uh, Ms. Pierce presenting on the topic of legal protection and health rights for the community against availability of the vaccines against COVID-19. 
Good evening, Miss Robin Pierce. I assume it's also very late at the moment in the Netherlands. <laughs> Um, but we would also really like to uh, convey our appreciation for your participation, despite it being very late and the time and the time is very different here in Indonesia, in Ambon. Uh, so without <laughs> wasting time, I'd like to invite you to deliver your presentation. Another reminder, you have 20 minutes and I will try and remind you when you have five minutes left to present. Thank you very much. Time is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in, I think, this very uh, important event. I hadn't planned to share my, to use uh, PowerPoint, but I think it probably is a good idea to do so. Um, let's see. Can you see my slides now? Yes, okay, thank Sorry. you. Great. Okay, so um, indeed, as, as uh, Dr. Herman just said, there is a, quite a bit of overlap in our presentations with the keynote speaker and the previous speaker. And I think they actually build on each other. And I hope to go into some areas that complement uh, what uh, Dr. Harmon just addressed. So really briefly, I will be looking at the right to health, um, a little more, uh, a little less actually on advanced purchase agreements and some of the problems and what it means for communities. And in this, I really want to focus on direct and indirect impacts. But I also want to examine what this means in the context of reality. So I'll look at the principle when principle meets reality. Then I'll make some concluding remarks. So it's been said that epidemics are a category of disease that hold up a mirror uh, to humanity to show us who we really are. And today when we look in that mirror, there's likely to be some or substantial disappointment. And part of this has to do with the gap between aspirational and practice and action, what we actually do. And so when we look at this from a rights perspective, one of the things we're doing is trying to address that gap between aspirational and action, uh, as Dr. Harmon has just done. And so when we look at human rights to offer a universal framework to advance justice and public health and taking a rights-based approach, we're looking to transform the power dynamic that underlies public health. So instead of having the population people being passive recipients of government benevolence, the kindness of the government, instead individuals are recognized as rights holders um, and human rights imposing obligations on duty bearers, government and other actors. But guaranteeing human rights for everyone poses a challenge for every country around the world, but of course, to differing degrees. Now, the focus of, of the right of health is characterized by attention to population health. We typically think it, of it in terms of infant mortality, industrial hygiene, prevention, um, treatment and control of epidemics and so forth. But it also goes into other, other issues, in, including in ensuring that people receive medical service and attention when they need it. Um, but the right is also understood to consist of protections and entitlements, both positive and negative. And so as this, this term that we're using quite a bit today, the right to a system of health protection, that is health care and underlying determinants of health, that provide equality of opportunity for people to enjoy the highest attainable standard of health. In the context of COVID, this would seem to require immediate and progressive steps to prevent a rising public health threat and requires furthermore that states take an additional measures to prevent or at least mitigate the impact of the disease. So it also, this obligation requires that all states who are in a position to assist must do so. This includes sharing research, sharing medical equipment, supplies, 
best practices, approaches. And fortunately, I think we all are seeing quite uh, increasing amounts of that kinds of sharing. Also coordination to reduce the economic and social impacts of the pandemic. I think one of the key aspects uh, that I think is, is part of the um, reason that we're having this event today is facilitating accountability for realizing this highest attainable standard of health. But typically during pandemics, ethicists, public health professionals, human rights advocates raise a red flag about what is the right course of action for public health. Um, and if we're looking at a, a, a pandemic situation, um, this has to be done through an integrated global policy. Well, it should be, it's best to done through an integrated global policy. Now, if we're looking at addressing the rights of communities, sometimes we'll look, look at health policy, public health policy on multiple levels. And we looked at this through the governmental and the non-governmental actors who execute these decisions and strategies with the goal of promoting priorities in health care. And this term priorities is going to be key throughout this uh, with the view, generally speaking, of, of ensuring the people are, are healthy. So we're looking in global health at issues that are beyond national boundaries, um, so solutions that require global coordination um, and justice for all communities, health justice for all communities. But despite repeated pleas from WHO and other organizations uh, for global solidarity in the COVID-19 response, many states have failed to provide sufficient international assistance and cooperation. This threatens the health and human rights of the most marginalized populations. And indeed, many states have faced difficulties in ensuring the availability and accessibility of COVID-19 related healthcare. And this is not just a matter of access to the vaccine, it's, it's a, a matter of access to a number of aspects of, of COVID related health care, um, diagnostic tests, ventilators, oxygen, and so forth, protective equipment. Uh, it requires then we look at it, this in the wider context. What is the absence of e equal access to vaccines? What is the impact in the larger context? And it, indeed, there are numerous sequelae on numerous levels. So where do international communities stand regarding the right to health? Well, nearly every country in the world has ratified at least one agreement um, agreeing to this. The right to health uh, depends on a variety of interdependent and interrelated human rights through public health systems, not just preventive, but also curative, as I said in the beginning, and encompassing underlying social, political, and economic determinants of health. And I'll get to this in a bit more detail when we go to uh, direct and indirect impacts. Um, we saw in the case of HIV that there was a focus on structural factors underlying HIV transmission because activists demanded a public health response. And you see on this slide, they looked at several different types of ways of engaging the community in addressing this uh, from a human rights uh, framework that ensured agency dignity and access. So um, just a quick word, I wanna highlight just a few aspects. I think Dr. Herman has done a, an excellent job of, of, of covering this and far more than I'm going to do. Um, that before vaccines for the coronavirus were even approved anywhere, governments were making deals for billions of dollars to procure lots of uh, the doses for their countries, even as these were still go running in clinical trials. Um, these yet to be approved vaccines were being purchased en masse in, the, in many, many countries. For example, the UK secured 250 million doses from four suppliers while it has a population of 66 million people. Now these strategies, this push and pull incentives of, of advanced purchase agreements are not new. We've seen them used before um, and seen them used successfully. Uh, but according to innovation policy scholar um, Sachs and, and her colleagues, uh, the COVID-19 vaccine agree agreements differ in at least three additional ways 
from the previous innovation promoting efforts, similar innovation promoting efforts. First, she says, she and her colleagues say, it's not at all clear that the advanced purchase commitments are needed to encourage companies to invest in the development of the vaccines. There, this is a global scale uh, pandemic. There's an enormous market. Did, were advanced purchase agreements really needed? And there's less concern that the disease will dissipate before the vaccine gets here. The second is that even if they're not needed to induce entry, they really can be valuable for increasing the speed of development. And third, um, and the most problematic, is that this may lead to a lack, or may and has led to a lack of supply for other countries. This is giving rise to the term vaccine nationalism. So there are some, as, as have been pointed out, good reasons for these agreements, but they also have sometimes problematic and even morally indefensible consequences. And this has resulted in a need for a framework for both equitable um, domestic as well as global allocation of COVID-19 vaccines. So one of the questions is, is this a reconcilable tension? Is the, the vaccine nationalism um, and the commitment to uh, equitable access? Well, of course, as we all know, vaccine nationalism um, encourages governments to secure priority access for future vaccines. They serve the national interest. Um, in fact, they serve the national um, requirement, obligation to protect the health of its citizens. And they view every government has, as having a moral duty to give priority to its own population before helping citizens abroad. Um, the, Oops. Um, and so what this consequences of this are, of course, that other countries have difficulty getting access to vaccines um, they're as the they're leading to delays and manufacturing capacity that's filled by the wealthier countries. This can also drive up prices. Um, and of course, uh, we've seen uh, instances of excessive purchase uh, far beyond what is uh, needed. Now, this mirrors, as Dr. Harmon just explained, this mirrors the wider health and health care inequities um, and is grounded in broader structural inequalities, putting some populations at greater risk than others. And in many cases, the COVID-19 deaths, and in many instances, the COVID-19 deaths and cases are highest among indigenous populations, racial minorities, the working poor, prisoners, detainees, and so forth. But I think it's important to look at why. What, what is at play here? So we're looking at instances of frontline workers. We're looking at instances of essential versus remote workers, again, affecting a particular segment of the population. We're looking at capacity for social distance, affecting poor populations rather than uh, wealthier ones. Housing and infrastructure also come into play. So we're looking at a mirroring and escalation exacerbation of existing inequities. And so the direct impact is on the poor, is often on the poor marginalized in the broader, but the broader impacts reverberate widely in elongating the pandemic with all sorts of economic, social, and educational sequelae. Um, so we, we said back in, in the 70s that smallpox anywhere was smallpox everywhere. And what we're seeing here is that the sheer vulnerability of human health, the fragility of social in institutions, and our profound interconnectedness urgently brings this new, this need for equitable, transparent methods of coordination, regulation, good governance, um, at the global level. Now, it would seem to have required, I'm actually going to quote from a Canadian bioethicist uh, who has looked at this issue um, and recently and has, you know, basically says that, yeah, we, we could do this, we can understand in some ways why countries would want to prioritize their own population. 
But it would seem, he says, that this would have required to preserve the lives of people at greatest risk, the elderly, healthcare professionals, people involved in, in patient care and so forth. These people should have been prioritized globally. Instead, he critiques countries of the global north have used their wealth to purchase vaccines many times their population over. And he turns his gaze onto his own country and notes that Canada purchased about 10 times, 10 vaccine doses per resident, um, not knowing, of course, whether or not they'd work. Um, and today, uh, Professor Udo Schlenkik um, says that Canada sits on many more vaccine doses than it can possibly administer. And repute apparently maybe um, has begun destroying expired doses or off and or offering third vaccine doses. In contrast, as has been pointed out by both previous speakers, Haiti, for example, this is only one example of many, only received its first shipment of vaccine doses in July 2021. That's 500,000 doses flown down from the US for a population of 11 million. And you saw the statistics uh, in the previous presentation. So there's no question, global governance institutions have failed to anticipate, prevent, or redress this inequality. And as of March 21st, several months ago, 78% of the 447 million deployed doses of COVID-19 vaccines were only in 10 countries. So we can, you know, listen to this, this Canadian bioethics. This is actually acknowledges the defense, as I said, um, and, and said, but there's a magnitude of other considerations. And this is a point that I think is, is worth making because it gets to the, the principle versus meets the reality uh, aspect of my talk. And that is that he points out that there's a pragmatic argument to be made in this. And he says that unlikely, it's unlikely that the citizens of these democratic countries would have taken kindly to a government that would have shared their purchased vaccines with poorer countries. And dem democracies where governments want to be reelected, such sharing would have guaranteed the government's defeat at the ballot box in the following uh, elections. Nevertheless, continuing stockpilings of global um, vaccines continues. It's a huge social justice issue. The right to health comes to meets and, and with regard to the social justice issue. Social justice is sitting squarely at the core of this situation. The privileged and wealthy are afforded more privilege and wealth while the less privileged and less wealthy are made even worse off. Um, the impact, as I said, on the persons who do not fall into these categories is far more severe. We can also look at this as an exacerbation of the problem. The direct impacts on the right to health, the right to protection from a deadly pandemic, a deadly virus, um, as well as uh, the need to eradicate the pandemic. But when we fail to do that, it prolongs the pandemic. And of course, this is uh, it's thought of in terms of equal rights. But what I want to spend a few, a, second, a few seconds on is the indirect impacts on interconnected rights. And so we're not just talking about access to vaccine, we're also talking about the other aspect of the right to health, which is the right to protections uh, of interconnected rights. So beyond the health system, social determinants of health. So that includes adequate housing, safe drinking water and sanitation, food, social security, and protection from violence. These kinds of interconnected rights, all of which have been affected by lack or lack of access to the vaccine. So lack of access to the vaccine. Um, so we have all of these issues. Um, but there's also other additional ones. For example, unvaccinated may be subject to travel uh, restrictions. But even as, sorry, 
Um, okay, so I want to get quickly to the issue of principle meets reality and respecting the rights of communities to health and well being. And these are both legal and ethical tensions, the two main opposing ideas with several in between. And essentially, it's getting at the question of how much commitment and self-denial can be asked from wealthier countries in order to promote access to vaccines for other countries. Well, the reality is the impossibility of having enough vaccines for everyone in the near future has opened the floor for debate about priority. What are the values? What are the ethical principles that should guide vaccine allocation? And I think that is also debatable and I will uh, challenge that. In a pandemic with a restricted supply of available vaccine, public health alone is unlikely to be sufficient to guide the decisions, especially in the early stages. Because if we take that view, then it means that human lives and the life's years that we are able to live are not universally valuable, which is a different kind of position than we want to take. So on the other side of, of on the, across the table from vaccine nationalism is vaccine cosmopolitanism. And this is a view of distributive justice that community membership, your nation uh, is simply irrelevant, that allocation should be independent of your national identity, irrespective of borders, and prioritize supply to countries according to their need. Is there a middle way? Well, we've looked at, uh, we're all aware of the COVAX facility uh, and how many have found this to be uh, disappointing, primarily because of the um, 20% of sufficiency to cover 20%. But the commitment, the resolution that the, to facilitate trade acquisition access and distribution of COVID-19 vaccines for all um, is important, but we will see hopefully that how this translates into regarding vaccine distribution. There are intersecting challenges, some of which have been spoken about today. For example, the privatization of healthcare services, facilities and goods, intellectual property rights is spoken about in our, with our keynote speaker. And then there's a huge irony of all of this. While we use human rights to defend and protect uh, justice in the health, public health context, um, there's also a way that states can employ human rights language to construct a self-serving narrative. So we've got this essentially double-edged sword where the right to health provides a level of deference to the state to decide who should receive access to health and at which point, um, and at which point. So the state says, yes, we have a right, we have a, a mandate, an obligation to protect our, our citizens. And in doing so, it may uh, run, it runs into, um, conflict with this other aspiration. And so the principle of progressive realization can also be used to justify this, these transgressions. Um, but what I'd like to suggest, and I will in a moment, is that the principle of progressive realization can be used in a positive sense in this context. So the meaningfulness of commitment in the context of principle meets reality um, really forces us to grapple with what does equitable access mean in a context of limited resources. And indeed, we many have called for a normative discussion to identify the actors who have this duty to um, provide equitable access and how far reaching these duties are. Is a country morally obliged to limit vaccine to high risk groups? Um, provide access to other citizens only once high-risk groups have been served? What is meant by COVID access, the, the concern? And prioritization is inevitable, or is it? Uh, I like the approach of, of viewing vaccines and immunization as a public good. And how do we navigate among morally defensible strategies with, if, if prioritization is not necessary or if it is? Um, so in guiding prioritization is typically done through three ways. 
uh, equality between all patients, patients who benefit most from the medical resources to maximize the outcome, um, sort of utilitarian approach, and then third, allocating resources to those with the, those with the highest medical need, um, a much more deontological approach. But it's interesting, some countries don't even allow that kind of parsing out prioritization. For example, in Egypt, it's not allowed to deny a patient the right to receive a life-saving medical service to be replaced by another patient whose survival chance is higher. So there's a very complex field. So as I go to the close, um, thank you. Um, as I go to the close, I just wanna point out the, the concept of, of progressive realization. That there's a reality that most healthcare systems around the world, yes, must function with limited resources. And there's a need to provide adequate care levels to everyone who needs it and maintain currently accepted standards. So this concept of progressive realization is essentially a commitment to allocating resources for healthcare systems <laughs> to be able to offer care such that everyone can achieve their highest possible level of health. So as science achieves these remarkable advances in COVID-19 vaccines, we really, it becomes compellingly clear that we cannot exclude others from benefiting from this advance. Such injustice is not only legally, politically, and morally unacceptable, it undermines all of our humanity. So where does this leave us as a differentially situated global community? Well, it's quite clear, we will only succeed if there is a global momentum and commitment to global equitable access. 11 years ago, I wrote an article, Expressive Function of Public Health Policy, the case of pandemic planning. And there the idea borrowed from Cass Sunstein, legal scholar, um, is that support for a law or policy may be primarily because of its expressive function. The statement it makes about underlying values. Rather the real focus is on the social meaning of these regulations. And therefore it can be a valuable tool to achieving other important goals. And so I want to ask, while we lament the gap between aspiration and commitment and action, where would we be without the expressive function? This commitment to equitable access plays a pivotal role, we hope, in the um, move towards equitable access for vaccines. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for another very insightful presentation on the impact it has on the community through uh, legal protection health rights and the availability of vaccines in the fight against COVID-19. I think it's very interesting to point out how you opened up the presentation in stating that the epidemic or pandemic is a mirror that reflects the inequalities already exist even before the pandemic and how that is exacerbated through um, the pandemic, which is something very interesting because when you explain using human rights as a sovereignty so that nations can't pick and choose who deserves to access the right to health, somehow that idea of inequality can can be lifted if we see human rights as something or see humans as basically holders of human rights and not have our human rights be dependent on another country or on our um, country's sovereignty or their ability to provide for us, which is how you talk about the impact it has on the community, uh, the international community, and how actually progressive realization should not only fall in the hands of one state towards their own population, but how progressive realization can exist within the international community. Exactly. So that people who are, who may be in developing countries, 
are not barred from benefiting these advanced, just something that is has already been stated by uh, Mr. Harmon previously in his uh, presentation as well, how in Article 15, we as humans have the right to benefit from these two. And I think it's very interesting regarding expressive function, which I think we will maybe hear more about in the discussion later. Uh, so yes, um, please allow me to maybe explain a little bit in Bahasa Indonesia for our other participants. Uh, bagi peserta dalam presentasi uh, Ibu Robin Pierce, uh, beliau menjelaskan tentang dampak uh, APA terhadap vaksin COVID-19 terhadap komunitas internasional dan bagaimana uh, adanya uh, perlindungan hukum untuk um, menjaga agar hal ini tidak terjadi uh, akses terhadap vaksin ini bisa menjadi adil. Um, konsep yang beliau menggunakan adalah vaksin cosmopolitanism yang menjelaskan bahwa kami sebagai uh, makhluk hidup atau sebagai manusia dapat mengakses hak atas, kes hak atas kesehatan dan hak asasi manusia lainnya bukan melalui uh, pemerintahan kami atau negara kami tetapi hanya sebagai seorang manusia sehingga hak atas kesehatan atau hak asasi manusia itu menjadi suatu uh, kedaulatan yang ada di dunia sehingga hak asasi manusia bukan lagi dipenuhi melalui pemerintah atau negara um, dan hal itu beliau menggunakan sebagai suatu konsep untuk untuk membuat vaksin ini sebagai suatu uh, barang yang dapat diakses semua orang jadi presentasi ini sangat berkaitan dengan presentasi sebelumnya mengenai um, hukum internasional dan bagaimana Pak, Har Pak Harmon uh, menjelaskan uh, efek uh, hukum internasional dalam mengatur akses. Uh, Ibu Pierce menjelaskan bagaimana konsep uh, komunitas internasional untuk mengakses vaksin itu bersama. Uh, so, thank you very much for your presentation, Ms. Pierce. Um, we will now continue on to our third presented today, we have the Dean of the Faculty of Law at Patimura University, Mr. Rory Akiwen. Uh, he will be presenting on the aspect of enforcement of business competition law, the pandemic era. Um, if the previous two presentations were from the aspect of international law, Mr. Rory Akiwen will delve deeper into the national manifestation of these um, principles and human rights and, and conventions that actually talk about the fulfillment of the right to health in the pandemic and throughout vaccines. Mr. Ak uh, Mr. Akiwen will explain how actually one of the actors that maybe hasn't really been discussed in this um, seminar is about the companies and how there is a uh, there's the competition law that protects or even regulates how they act uh, within the pandemic. So, but before I say too much about this, I will uh, would like to invite Mr. Rory Akiwen to present on this topic. Thank you, Agnes. Uh, good morning, all participation. I see you are very happy today, Miss Agnes. Why? It's a, a very good yes, uh, discussion. Uh, yesterday, Oh. So maybe. Uh... Uh, yes, yesterday um, I, I I just completed my bachelor thesis defense on a topic that is not very different from our topic today. So I'm still very excited about this topic, and I still have a lot of thoughts kind of running through my head. So okay, thank oh, you for okay, mentioning okay. that. Success always for you, Miss Agnes. To Mr. Sean Herman and Miss uh, Miss Robin Pierce. My uh, fellow estimate panelists and all participation for my presentation on the topic of competition law enforcement in the pandemic era. I apologize in advance to Mr. Hermel space that I will deliver my material in Bahasa Indonesia, but the moderator will, uh, Ms. Agnes, uh, will translate in English. Oke, okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera untuk kita sekalian. Next. 
bicara soal penegakan hukum kita pasti tentu akan bicara soal kepastian hukum, kemanfaatan dan keadilan hukum berfungsi sebagai perlindungan kepentingan manusia dan agar kepentingan manusia itu bisa terlindungi maka hukum itu harus dilaksanakan nah, pelaksanaan hukum dapat berlangsung secara normal dapat berlangsung secara normal, damai tapi dapat juga terjadi karena pelanggaran hukum. Nah, melalui penegakan hukum inilah hukum menjadi kenyataan. Dalam penegakan hukum ada tiga unsur yang perlu diperhatikan yaitu kepastian hukum, legal setting, basic arcade, kemudian benefits, swag market, justice, direct aid. Next. what uh, our team has said is that law actually functions as a way to protect the interests of humanity. Uh, so that interests can be uh, fulfilled, humans must, uh, people must be protected by the laws and this must be implemented. The implementation of these laws uh, should be implemented um, However, there can still be uh, ways that people violate Laws. Through the enforcement of law, we see that there is the reality. Uh, the reality is that there are three very important factors that need to be fulfilled so that this law can be implemented, which is um, the Rex this hype, um, which is about how law has to be. Right. Legal certainty, and it has to be certain, um, and there has to be a benefits, and lastly, lastly, there has to be justice. Ya, saudara uh, sekalian, bicara soal kepastian hukum ada istilah yang uh, pernah disampaikan oleh Raja Ferdinand pertama dari Hongaria yang uh, pemerintah dan itu kita antara tahun 1558 sampai dengan 1564 itu uh, yang namanya fiat istisya et perit mundus. Meskipun dunia ini runtuh, hukum harus ditegakkan. Nah ini mirip dengan fiat istisya ruat kolum oleh Lucius Capulnius Piso Saesanomius yang hidup di abad 43 sebelum masehi. Uh, Saudara sekalian, pandemi COVID-19 ini uh, belum membuat dunia hancur. Dunia hanya terseok-seok, dunia hanya bingung, dunia hanya meratap, tetapi belum hancur. Tetapi hukum tetap harus kita tegakkan. Law, whatever happens, law must still be upheld, must be still enforced. So even if the pandemic has really dire consequences, whatever happens, it means that we still need to make sure that law is can be pursued and enforced based on what the King Ferdinand I from Hungary has conveyed in 1558, um, which is on the principle of fiat justitia et periat nullus. Kepastian juga memberikan perlindungan terhadap tindakan sewenang memang yang berarti bahwa seseorang akan memperoleh sesuatu yang diharapkan dalam keadaan tertentu. Nah, Pandemi COVID, fakta membuktikan bahwa masyarakat itu untuk mendapatkan perlindungan, terutama obat-obatan yang berkaitan dengan COVID-19, alat pelindung diri, masker, kemudian rapid dan swab antigen itu sangat merasakan di dalam kehidupan masyarakat, sehingga kepastian hukum ini harus kita dibicarakan sehingga uh, masyarakat mendapatkan sesuatu yang dalam keadaan apapun hak dari warga negara Indonesia itu harus dilindungi dan sesuai dengan amanat dari konstitusi kita. Sorry, the why it's important to enforce 
a lot even during a global pandemic that can be quite difficult at times it's because law actually provides protection towards the actions that that can that can be um that people in power or with high figure um how we can actually use the their power to do unfair things to other people. Therefore, law needs to exist and be protected to ensure that these things don't happen. Pada akhirnya, dari kepastian hukum itu, masyarakat mengharapkan adanya uh, ketertiban sehingga hukum menciptakan kepastian hukum karena bertujuan untuk uh, ketertiban di masyarakat. Through this, we see that uh, society or the people uh, require or hope for that the law must always be upheld. Uh, it certainly must be upheld because without that, there is there won't be um, there won't be their protection towards towards things that are injustice. And that's why law actually functions to be certain in to make sure that the society can remain peaceful. Penegakan hukum juga mem- memperhatikan faktor kemanfaatan. Dalam penegakan hukum harus ada manfaat bagi manusia. Karena hukum adalah untuk manusia, maka pelaksanaan atau penegakan hukum harus memberi manfaat atau kegunaan bagi masyarakat. Apabila tidak mem- memberikan kemanfaat, maka hukum itu akan menimbulkan keresahan dalam masyarakat. Besides legal certainty, there has to also be the benefit of law, and law needs to exist fully to benefit um, humanity. Justice. Next. Next. Justice. Hukum tidak identik dengan keadilan, artinya bersifat, bersifat umum. Barang siapa mencuri harus dihukum. Keadilan bersifat subjektif, individualistis, dan tidak menyamaratakan. Adil bagi si Rory belum tentu dirasakan adil bagi si John. The reality of law is that law does not, I, does not completely mean justice because justice is something that is very subjective and that something for Mr. Worry could that is fair could mean something else for John. Dampak dari COVID-19, kita lihat bahwa uh, masyarakat, khususnya masyarakat Indonesia, menjadi panik dengan pemberitaan di media yang begitu mengerikan uh, terkait dengan dampak COVID-19 sehingga masyarakat memburu apapun terutama obat-obatan untuk meningkatkan imun sehingga terjadi kelangkaan obat bagi tenaga medis ada kelangkaan alat pelindung diri nah data bahwa banyak tenaga medis yang meninggal dan masyarakat juga menghadapi persoalan harga obat rapid test dan swab yang begitu mahal this idea of Justice that is very subjective is something that is clear within the impact of the COVID-19. Next. We see that um, the COVID-19 uh, has shown that people are really quick to fulfill their, their needs and their rights to health by panic buying, um, which which reduces this um, the, the lack of. Um, access to different medical supplies because everyone is trying to buy as much for themselves without seeing the access to people who might not be able to do this. Therefore, it becomes um, the rapid test. Next. Penegakan hukum persaingan usaha uh, sebetulnya dimulai dari Artikel atau pasal 33 Undang-Undang Dasar Negara Republik Indonesia 1945, Undang-Undang Anti Monopoli, Komisi Pengawas Persaingan Usaha Indonesia. Next. Ya. Yeah. 
Harold Jelaski mengemukakan bahwa uh, tujuan negara yakni untuk menciptakan keadaan di mana rakyatnya mendapat uh, dapat mencapai keinginan secara maksimal. Jeremy Bentham dengan prinsip utilitarisme bahagia ekstra adalah sesuatu yang baik. Sesuatu yang menimbulkan sakit adalah buruk. Pemerintah dalam aksinya harus diarahkan untuk tingkatkan kebahagiaan sebanyak mungkin manusia. According to Article 33, Paragraph 2, we see that the the ideas that were um, conveyed by Harold J. Lasky that says that the role of the country or the, their objective is actually to create a situation or condition where their their people are able to fulfill their full needs for wants. Uh, maximum. Je Jeremy Bentham. This also supports the ideas brought forward by Jer Jeremy Bentham that um, about the principle of utilitarianism that talks about how extra happiness is actually a good thing. Due to this, the government or the, the state must um, implement or direct uh, the Uh, bunyi pasal 33 ayat 2 next balik ke yang tadi yang tadi next Bunyi pasal 33 ayat 2, cabang-cabang produksi yang penting bagi negara dan menguasai hajat hidup orang banyak dikuasai oleh negara. Supomo mengemukakan bahwa penguasa negara itu bisa diartikan mengatur dan atau menyelenggarakan, terutama untuk memperbaiki dan mempertinggi produksi. Nah, penguasaan, gue, gue namanya. penguasaan negara bukanlah dalam arti memiliki cabang-cabang produksi yang penting bagi negara dan yang menguasai hajat, hajat hidup orang banyak, akan tetapi hanya terbatas sebagai kuasa usaha penyelenggara cabang-cabang produksi tersebut untuk kesejahteraan rakyat banyak. Article 33, verse 2, states that the different, uh, different uh, institutions within the country, have, yeah, the different institutions, production institutions in the country have a are really important to the country because they are the ones that can provide for the continuation of life in the future. Um, and that, that I, the protection of life, actually the responsibility that must be fulfilled by the country itself. Supomo conveys that the, the country, the state has to actually find um, the direction of how this can actually be implemented and how they can maximize the production for these products that can protect the society. The role of the country is not in this definition just about the um, production aspect, but it's also important for the state to direct how people can access these products without uh, without uh, disregarding the rights of the production company. Yeah. Apabila negara, uh, ter terutama dengan COVID-19, itu tidak bisa uh, menyediakan barang dan jasa yang dapat dijangkau oleh masyarakat, contohnya obat-obatan terkait COVID dan lain-lain, maka negara bisa bekerja sama. Nah ini uh, seperti yang disampaikan Mr. Harman dan Miss Robin, uh, apa itu itu bisa di, di apa dilakukan oleh negara dan saya kira perkembangan-perkembangan uh, pada saat kita mendatangkan uh, vaksin-vaksin uh, itu sudah uh, ada kerjasama antara negara dengan uh, pihak swasta maupun negara dengan uh, dengan negara. 
So in the case of the pandemic, if the state or countries cannot directly produce uh, medical supplies for the population, then that puts the position of the state to actually be able to cooperate with uh, private companies and businesses to provide the necessary medical equipment. Akhirnya uh, di, dari pasal 33 ini uh, endingnya harus um, untuk kemakmuran rakyat. Itu menjadi tujuan utama dari negara. This function exists so that we can see that the country live prosper even throughout the pandemic. Next. Undang-undang anti monopoli uh, Indonesia memiliki undang-undang anti monopoli nomor 5 tahun 99 tentang larangan praktik monopoli dan persaingan usaha tidak sehat yang biasanya disebut undang-undang anti monopoli. Nah, pengertian monopoli menurut pasal 1 angka 1 penguasaan atas produksi dan atau pemasaran barang dan atau jasa tertentu oleh satu pelaku usaha atau sekelompok pelaku usaha. In Indonesia we have certain regulations that that regulate monopoly that can happen uh, between uh, companies. So, uh, law number five, 1995, actually regulates about the monopoly tactics and the competition between companies and businesses that is not healthy. Uh, Kartel. Kartel adalah persenutuan atau persekutuan di antara beberapa produsen uh, produk sejenis dengan maksud untuk mengontrol produksi, harga, dan penjualannya serta untuk memperoleh posisi monopoli. So, so, if monopoly is the ability or the action of con uh, companies to control one type of product in the market, a cartel is the idea of give, um, production of different produces to in, in order to control the production and prices in, its, uh, in the market. Yang bertugas untuk mengawasi persaingan usaha termasuk peredaran obat-obat uh, APD maupun uh, rapid dan swab itu ada yang namanya komisi pengawas persaingan usaha. Ada beberapa menurut pasal 35 ada beberapa tugas yang dia harus uh, lakukan. Yang pertama itu penilaian terhadap perjanjian yang dapat mengakibatkan monopoli dan persaingan usaha tidak sehat, kegiatan usaha yang dapat menimbulkan monopoli dan persaingan usaha tidak sehat, dan ada kewenangan-kewenangan lain di antaranya mengambil tindakan sesuai wewenangnya. Nah, misalnya saudara-saudara sekalian uh, kita tidak bisa menerapkan hukum persaingan usaha di tengah pandemi COVID. Ada pengadaan barang dan jasa. Ya, ya. Ada pengadaan barang dan jasa terutama untuk penyediaan uh, vaksin, itu kalau uh, dalam kondisi normal harus melalui tender. Tetapi KPPU mem membuat kebijakan bahwa ini kondisi bukan normal sehingga memberikan keleluasaan, memberikan keringanan bagi para pengusaha negara BUMN maupun para pengusaha untuk bisa apa melaksanakan atau membuat pengadaan barang dan jasa itu tanpa melalui tender terkait dengan barang-barang yang menguasai hajat hidup orang banyak dan di mata pandemi COVID-19 ini vaksin itu dianggap menguasai hajat hidup orang banyak sehingga tender Diabaikan. In Indonesia, we have in Indonesia we have the commission of competition between companies evaluation commission, and this commission actually works to make sure that during a global a crisis such as the COVID nineteen pandem pandemic, um, production of vaccine to the population. So in a normal condition, the production of vaccine and it actually does do contract that um, allows the company to have a vaccine and a vaccine and However, this commission has actually implemented a law that during a 
health crisis such as this, products that have a large impact on the society or the population, such as vaccines or other medical equipment, can be Nah, di negara lain, contohnya di Afrika Selatan, Afrika Selatan pada saat pandemi uh, South Africa, uh, pada saat pandemi COVID, COVID-19 itu mengabaikan penegakan hukum terkait dengan perbankan dan jasa kesehatan. Di Jerman misalnya dalam kompetisi bola mereka mengabaikan apa-apa praktek-praktek dalam dunia bisnis untuk uh, menyiarkan kompetisi itu tidak lagi uh, pemerintah Jerman atau komisi pengawas sejenis dengan KPPU itu tidak lagi menjas atau memfonis ada tindakan monopoli atau ada persaingan usaha tidak sehat karena uh, dalam konteks COVID-19 itu semua di untuk sementara diabaikan karena kondisinya tidak normal sama seperti di Indonesia tetapi di Indonesia uh, law enforcementnya agak sedikit terhambat sehingga kadang terkait dengan perbankan masyarakat terkadang bingung karena ada uh, miskomunikasi misunderstanding antara uh, dealer antara perbankan atau antara um, lembaga-lembaga keuangan dengan para dengan masyarakat atau konsumen. Modified for the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as in Germany regarding uh, football competition and how they disregard company or business competition laws to ensure that uh, it is safe and fair. Last. Uh, Prinsipnya. Saudara-saudara sekalian bahwa negara sesuai dengan konstitusi wajib menyediakan wajib menyediakan barang dan jasa yang berkualitas dan dapat terdijangkau harganya dapat dijangkau oleh masyarakat. Kondisi yang kita alami dengan rapid test yang begitu mahal, swab test, kemudian kelangkaan-kelangkaan obat uh, pendukung untuk Anda memutuskan mata rantai virus atau COVID-19 itu sangat merasakan di dalam masyarakat. Negara belum runtuh. COVID masih apa, bergaul dengan kita, tetapi kewajiban negara sesuai dengan konstitusi harus membuat masyarakat bahagia seperti kata Jeremy Bentham dengan menyiapkan barang dan jasa yang berkualitas dan dapat dijangkau bukan uh, menimbulkan keresahan dengan uh, kondisi COVID-19. Saya kira itu, terima kasih Miss Agnes. Even if it is hard for them to fulfill these obligations, it's still to make sure that the prosperity of their citizens can be fulfilled. And if there is means to not fulfill certain products, then the country who plays must use the war to fulfill their rights and the access to those products, such as Mr. Rory Akiwen's uh, presentation. Um, so with that, it concludes our three presentations for this morning. I apologize because we're actually running a little bit late on schedule, but I think
mean that it would not be fair if we did not engage in some discussion, some question and answer section. So there are already some questions within uh, the chat. Uh, that actually the, 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 ask, the ask of the questions, there's already some discussion happening within the chat. Um, so, Uh, and is my voice clear or is, is there still some problems? It, it's a little bit better. Is it is it better now? Okay. I'm glad to hear that. Okay, so I'm even though there's some discussion happening in the chat, I think it'd be really good if we could just do it uh, within the forum. Uh, so first of all we have a question by uh, no, we have a statement by Mr. Harbour that actually says that the idea of vaccine cosmopolitan is interesting and grounded in solidarity, but it would require a completely different approach to purchasing. At root is the question. I think he conveys this question convey, uh, question to Miss Rob Pierce. Uh, how do we get states to give up some of this? I lost the sound. I'm, I'm so sorry for the technical difficulties. Am I audible? Yes, now. Okay. Um, I was just... Um, so I just read out the question that Mr. Sean Harmon delivered in the chat. And I'm pretty sure that question was uh, towards for your material. And I was just wondering if you would be able to answer the question of how do we get states to give up some of their sovereignty in relation to purchasing so that high-risk groups around the world can be vaccinated before more than our rollouts? Yeah, it's, it's the question of the day, isn't it? Um, it's the big challenge. I think there are probably at least a couple of responses to that. One is um, we talk about it in terms of um, being altruistic. But in fact, there's a, as much uh, self-interest involved in the sharing of um, vaccines uh, as there is um, altruism. So I don't think we need to necessarily rely on that. Um, I think there is, 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 is this factor. We also know that where there are pockets or large pockets or regions of unvaccinated people, that there's more op more opportunity for mutations of the virus, uh, which is how we ended up with Delta, um, that can be you know, even worse and not only prolong the pandemic, but make it worse. So there's, I think there's, there's that. Um, I, I think building in mechanisms of accountability, uh, what those would look like, I'm not sure whether these would be mandates, some sort of global governance that um, fall, uh, comes short of imposing penalties, but certainly um, imposes uh, sort of expressive functions, <laughs> expressive <laughs> obligations. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Uh, so in conclusion, do you think the answer is more politics as opposed to law? Um, well, I think you can't do it without either, frankly. I think um, politics without law uh, is open, it, it leaves the door open um, for all sorts of, but law without politics uh, is basically letters, words on a page. And so I think they have to work in concert. Thank you for that. So did you need uh, to be allowed to say it in Bahasa? Uh, 
itu yang digunakan yang dapat berlawan dari politik internasional dan hukum internasional sehingga harus ada sinergi antara antara kedua aspek itu bagaimana kita bisa melakukan suatu framework atau satu kerjasama yang melibatkan semua negara dan itu memang membutuhkan proses uh, bukan saja melalui, melalui politik uh, internasional tetapi juga dasar-dasar hukum internasional dan agar dasar-dasar hukum internasional itu dapat ditegakkan politiknya harus juga uh, atau tujuan politik bersama harus juga tercapai sehingga uh, hukum itu dapat ditegakkan so thank you very much for that miss robin um, we have some questions also from the inter- from patimura university international office from miss revensi rugubrek um, she firstly asked uh, mr sean harman regarding the cases of blood clots that occurred in the number of countries due to the immunization of astrazeneca um i think mr sean has already tried has already answered that in the question uh, in the chat box however maybe you can maybe convey a little bit of the understanding you have regarding that yeah the, thank you um there was uh, can, can you hear me okay yes yeah okay good yeah um yeah it, it, it created a bit of controversies here certainly um and there was a bit of a change in, in the recommendation profile related to that particular vaccine and um some people choosing not not to get it uh, but it is still being used as far as I know although I think some of the the uh, stock was was donated uh, outward um, but I mean what one of the one of the things that this raised certainly this um, that reality sort of coming coming to the surface uh, gave the the those who were against vaccination, uh, some some ammunition to use, and um, it, it required, you know, uh, the problem is a, a lot of people. Uh, there's a lot of noise out there around around immunization, and so uh, it was one of those instances where a, a lot of care had to be taken by the government and how it conveyed to publics, you know, what it was doing, and that. In, in a situation like this, where uh, it's very dynamic, um, new evidence is being generated all the time. And so recommendations around a vaccine can change. And this isn't because of, of conspiracies or people being secretive, it's because new evidence comes to light. And so um, certainly it was a, uh, a, a, a bit of a, uh, an issue here but uh, I think it's still being, I think that vaccine is still being used. I think maybe regarding your statement as well, the dissemination of uh, information from the government towards the people is actually very important because whilst back the access to vaccine is very hard, but actually to get people to actually get vaccinated is also another issue in itself. So um, yes, thank you for- uh, so important. Yeah, so it's 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 something to consider as well. Not just the access, but even if people get access, how is the how is vaccination being portrayed in the media, and how do we get people to come up, come on board of the immunization train? So thank you for that. Um, maybe just to, because we have some questions for Miss Pierce and then Mr. Rory after this as well. Um, there's also another question that. Um, I have as a moderator, just to wrap up the questions for you. Um, regarding uh, international law and regarding um, intellectual property and the equal access to vaccine, how do you think international law can act as a way to both protect interne- uh, intellectual property, but also ensure uh, equitable access to vaccines? Because um, re- regarding Miss Robin's presentation as well, we see that inter- intellectual property is actually very important to ensure that there is incentive to c- continue to create vaccines. But at this 
point of time, the pandemic is raging. It's still raging and we still need more vaccines. And somehow APAs use the TRIPS agreement and use intellectual property to create these mon monopoly prices. So how do you think we can balance between those two things? Uh, I think it's, it's difficult and it's a problem. First of all, uh, we have to recognize that that rights to intellectual property are not on the same level as rights to, to health. Um, they're just not fundamental, uh, you, you know, intellectual property rights aren't fundamental rights. Rights to health, rights uh, to, to physical integrity, these are fundamental rights. So they don't balance. Um, and the, the difficulty is that we've created some quite strong infrastructure around the one, but not necessarily around, around the other. And, uh, you know, I think also what, what, this, what this pandemic has shown is that um, I th obviously intellectual property rights were important and were important to the developers, but, but there, there would have been innovation. I think this was, this was uh, you know, raised by, by a couple of the speakers and certainly by Robin that there was, there was gonna be innovation happening. Um, because there was a lot of money to be made, regardless of how strongly I think the protections are around around the uh, the intellectual property of the medicines that are that are being generated, and so you know we've recognized that intellectual property can be a barrier to access, and so we have um, compulsory licensing uh, as part of the international law around trade but we certainly don't use it very often so when we think about um who's acting and and what it is that they deserve um as far as uh, returns we have to recognize that all you know all, all of these vaccines have a significant amount of public money uh, that's invested in them and so we need to we do need to think about what is a, a fair return for the private actors that are stepping up? Uh, maybe if I can just add one more, just, I, maybe just a short explanation. If public money is the case here and how vaccines are actually a, a product of the investment, how does that translate into international um, community where maybe Indonesia who requires the vaccine is not investing in companies that are in the US or in the UK and how how do we access that even if we are not invested within that and even if the countries or the states in the US are investing there's also that problem of um, them having an interest to fulfill the rights of their country first and foremost so how do you think um, the international community uh, benefits from that yeah that's a hard one and I'd be interested to hear what some of the other speakers think about that I mean I guess You know, the, the, the right to, to access to the benefits of science isn't premised on, on contributing to, to, to that science. So we need to be cognizant of, of that right when we're thinking about um, the extent to which we need to contribute in order to benefit, I think. Okay, thank you very much for, for your explanation. I think it, it it has explained a lot. Also, that's a lot of room for um, further research. And hopefully in the future, we see some way that we can access vaccines more uh, equitably um, where, without having to de uh, depend on, you know, the goodwill of nations, but actually there being an international uh, legal regime that you previously said in your presentation. So thank you for that. So now we actually Certainly. have some... I just, I just add that certainly what 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 would be beneficial, um, quite aside from law, is um, we need a, a, a greater diversification of manufacturing capabilities. Mm -hmm. um, in Canada, we used to, so in Canada, for example, we have no um, vaccine manufacturing capabilities. We used to, and we divested ourselves of that. And uh, because of the pandemic now, there's a lot more talk around needing to rebuild our vaccine manufacturing capability. And, I, and, and there's even talk of uh, that way we could 
provide vaccines to the world. And I think um, that uh, greater vaccine manufacturing capability in different parts of the world will be important to responding to further pandemics. Yes, uh, that's, that's a very interesting point, mate. So it's not just about the obligation of states to contribute internationally, but actually the ability of other states to produce their own vaccines. So I think that's a, that's a very great uh, point. Thank you for that, uh, Mr. Harvin. Uh, now we're going to continue to uh, Ms. Rufensi's question to Ms. Robin Pierce is relating to human rights to get the vaccine. Do you think it is a right or an obligation? Because there are so many citizens who do not want to be vaccinated. Sorry, you're unmute. Oh, okay. I was having difficulty unmuting. Um, that's a really challenging question. I think it's uh, without question, it's a right. How we realize or implement that right is, is why we're here today. Whether or not it's an obligation um, is, is, is complex because it meets, it rubs up against other liberties and rights. And to sort of categorically make that classification um, that it is an obligation, uh, a, a legal obligation, I think it may be sort of painting an issue that, yeah, is inconvenient now, but um, stands on, I think, important liberties that we recognize in the society. I think this is one of the instances where we can engage in the sort of um, behavioral economics um, types of approaches to facilitate, nudge, um, uh, encourage people to, to do, to, to do, to get up, to take the vaccine. But in recognition of extremely important liberties, I think we should probably explore those um, non mandatory considerations before we go to the mandatory um, vaccines. Thank you for that, Ms. Robin. I hope that answers this for Francie's question. Um, there's also another question by uh, uh, Madeline. And she talks about, uh, she's asking about the right to vaccines, not only by, uh, not only by citizens, but also uh, refugees that live in, uh, in camps and because of the shortage of vaccines. How do you think in approach to interna international law, how can we provide for them and make sure that they are also vaccinated? Yeah, I think that's an extremely important question um, as well. And, and, you know, it's often un overlooked. It, it, refugees are often the, the, the person, the invisible population. And indeed, they fall very much within the category of marginalized persons that is a priority for public health. And so, um, you know, let's look at the language of, the, of human rights, human rights, not, you know, national citizens. So it's, 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 it's very clear that refugees should um, be included uh, with regard to this. Well, who has that obligation? Um, if there is a, a lack of sort of national um, uh, identity or a, a, a attachment association, then, you know, we can then pull out the, the, um, the sovereignty, the, the sovereignty issue uh, that uh, states can utilize to justify uh, not honoring human rights for persons outside of their territories. So it's, it's a complex issue. I think we can look at this aspirational commitment to human rights and the right to health um, and look at different ways to make that, um, to, to make that an accountable um, obligation. And so, you know, I, I, I really enjoyed Sean's um, recommendation about expanding manufacturing capacity because basically where I think this needs to go is giving the concept, the, the, the principle of progressive realization, giving it teeth 
And expanding the, met, the manufacturing capacity is one of the ways. Making it a public good is another way uh, so that we can honor this as a human right as opposed to um, operating out of national interest. Thank you for that, Ms. Robin. Uh, I think that has a big correlation with your principle on uh, vaccine cosmopolitanism about how us as human rights, uh, us as humans should have access to rights, not just because of our citizenship, but because we are humans at the very first place. So I think I hope that answers Ms. Madeline's question regarding the access to um, vaccines through refugees and just how uh, different stakeholders in the international community can fulfill that. Um, so we have one last question for Mr. Rory Akiwan from Ms. Refensi Rugubrek um, regarding, can the vaccine be traded or sold at a certain price? Considering that nowadays people are getting free vaccines, but some are getting them at a certain cost. Um, Maybe Mr. Rory Akwin. Uh, uh, so, jadi pertanyaan yang tanya Ibu Fancy terhadap Pak Rory adalah uh, apakah harga harga vaksin dapat ditetapkan um, atau apakah vaksin dapat dijual jual perbelikan dengan harga tertentu? Mungkin Pak Rory bisa langsung menjawab. Yeah, uh, thank you, Ibu Fancy atas pertanyaannya, kenapa saya minta diterjemahkan oleh moderator agar partisipa, partisipan juga paham apa yang ditanyakan oleh Ibu Pensi. Nah, dalam hukum persaingan usaha, saudara-saudara sekalian, itu merupakan salah satu implementasi di bidang ekonomi, implementasi dari pasal 33 ayat 2. Nah, sudah saya katakan tadi bahwa negara wajib menyediakan barang dan jasa yang berkualitas, apalagi yang menguasai hajat hidup orang banyak dengan harga yang terjangkau. Itu, itu tanggung jawab negara. Nah, kalaupun uh, negara yang diwakili oleh badan usaha milik negara uh, memproduksi, menjual, nah, ini pun tidak terlepas dari apa yang diamanatkan pasal 33 ayat 2. Nah, berapapun harganya, uh, intinya harus terjangkau oleh uh, masyarakat atau mampu di, dibeli oleh masyarakat. Nah, pasal 51 Undang-Undang 599 soal anti-monopoli itu memang memberikan kewenangan penuh atau memberikan hak monopoli bagi BUMN. Nah, karena itu dia itu sejalan dengan apa yang diamanatkan pasal 33. Menentukan harga atau menyamar, menyamaratakan harga Nah itu bisa dilakukan oleh negara melalui BUMN. Yang penting barang dan jasa itu dia menguasai hajat hidup orang banyak dan penting bagi negara. Nah kalau tidak penting dan tidak menguasai hajat hidup orang banyak itu biasanya diserahkan ke pasar mekanisme harganya. Tetapi ya menurut saya pribadi kalau melihat perkembangan langkahnya obat-obatan, APD, kemudian mahal bervariasi harga rapid test dan juga swab, ini sebetulnya negara harus mengambil alih dengan menetapkan harga yang bisa dijangkau oleh masyarakat. Nah, kita tahu bahwa terutama pegawai negeri, kita mungkin bisa dibiayai oleh negara untuk kita sekali berangkat ke Jakarta, tetapi bagi masyarakat yang ingin melakukan aktivitas pribadi, ini sangat memberatkan. Nah ini yang yang, yang sebetulnya uh, uh, kondisi COVID ini yang saya uh, awali dengan uh, hukum harus ditegakkan karena sekalipun dunia runtuh COVID ini belum mem, belum meruntuhkan dunia bahkan belum meruntuhkan negara Indonesia sehingga proses penegakan ini perlu di diimplementasikan kalau KPPU memberikan kelonggaran masa negara tidak bisa memberikan kelonggaran negara harus uh, melalui BUMN negara harus berperan karena Menurut Friedman, salah satunya negara itu kan sebagai pelayan, melayani. Ya kan? nah, jadi ini sebetulnya Ibu Fensi bisa, tetapi ini tergantung dari kemauan daripada negara atau pemerintah Indonesia. Terima kasih. Maybe in a short, a short conclusion in English. Um, so according to Article 22 of our Constitution, is that countries have a obligation to fulfill the basic needs of 
their society. This includes uh, access to products, especially medical products during the pandemic. And this can be done, uh, Mr. Rory says that this can be done through uh, countries intervening, whether that be intervening in state or in companies or even private companies, uh, countries should be able to uh, set a, a set price or set price for these vaccines. And um, this is because countries or states or governments at the very core are actually servers of the population of society. And, uh, that should be the, one of their main goals and especially during the pandemic even if it's hard to implement a law or to fulfill uh, certain regulations in our national uh, legal system uh, the world hasn't ended yet so therefore the law must still be upheld and I think that just concludes um, Mr. Rory's answer to Ms. Fancy's question. So I think because we've used we've used up to half an hour over our allotted time, I think as a moderator, I'm going to cut the discussion session there. I thank everyone and all the participants that were able to contribute in this session. It has definitely made uh, it more the the session more lively. So thank you for that. Before we end uh, this plenary session, I'm going to ask each of the speakers to give a short closing statement, probably one to two sentences um, regarding the, the plenary session today and the topic on advanced projects of the Thank you, uh, Ms. Agnes. Ibu sekalian, dunia boleh runtuh. Kemudian grup tetap uh, dilaksanakan dengan memperhatikan kebetulan masyarakat. Terus tetap buat masyarakat bahagia, kalau sakit itu buruk. Thank you. Short translation, uh, the world might come to an end or the pandemic might wreck heaven, but states might still have their responsibility and obligation to fulfill all the rights of their citizens. And just like what Jeremy Beck said, uh, happiness is good, but the destruction of happiness is completely bad. So thank you for that, Mr. Dobiyaku, and for that closing um, Now I would like to ask Ms. Robin Pitt to make a short one. Thank you. Um, I would simply like to address the fact that we are looking at a, a situation of limited resources. And so I think one of the ways that we can approach this is through giving teeth to progressive realization and not progressive realization for the short term, but for the broader term, for the longer term. So not how do we get vaccines for this population? How do we ensure that everyone its access to the vaccine. Thank you for that. Such a resounding statement and hopefully something that uh, whoever hears this and has access to maybe promote that statement uh, can fulfill that. Jadi yang dikatakan Ibu Robin adalah suatu hal penting yang harus diharapkan dari pandemi ini adalah realisasi progresif atau progresif realization um, bahwa pandemi ini menjadi suatu ruang untuk kita berkembang dan melihat aspek-aspek hak atas kesehatan itu untuk terus uh, dikembangkan bukan saja secara jangka pendek tapi juga dalam kurun uh, waktu jangka panjang so, um, setelah pandemi ini uh, so thank you for that, Ms. Olympias. Uh, such an honor. Um, and lastly, to uh, Mr. Harmon, maybe you can give uh, your closing statement. Uh, thank you. I guess as a parting thought, um, it would be that uh, there was a lot of rhetoric toward the, toward the start of the pandemic about this being an opportunity for us to come together and it didn't really happen uh, the way we may have wanted it to. And I think it'll be important for um, not just the international legal system, but for, for domestic governments to um, take lessons 
from what's been happening um, in ways that we sort of haven't in the past, uh, but to really reflect on, on what's happened and what could have been done better and to not uh, put public health in the sort of impoverished position that it has traditionally held. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mr. Harmon. Uh, I think those are very uh, strong uh, statements to end this uh, session with. Uh, just a short translation for other participants. Um, Pak Harmon menyatakan bahwa sebenarnya pandemi ini seharusnya menjadi suatu keadaan di mana negara-negara atau komunitas internasional itu bisa belajar untuk bekerja sama menghadapi suatu uh, krisis uh, kesehatan dunia. Tetapi hal itu tidak terjadi, sehingga ini harus menjadi suatu bahan evaluasi, bukan saja untuk komunitas internasional, tetapi juga pemerintahan domestik, bagaimana dapat menghadapi uh, krisis-krisis ke depannya, atau bagaimana suatu sistem kesehatan itu dapat diperbaiki uh, dan dibuat lebih efektif lagi. So thank you for that. Um, um, in conclusion, uh, for this uh, plenary session, I think we have discussed and learned a lot of things, firstly regarding um, global health justice and vaccine procurement from the aspect of um, international law and how the vaccine, something that should be accessed by everyone, is somehow made into a commodity. And there are solutions that we can take or uh, Im implement. However, that needs a lot of um, global coordination, a lot of actually invested interest from many different stakeholders, especially um, countries with larger bargaining power. But furthermore than uh, that, we see that, that that invested interest must also be translated into a domestic uh, arena in, within for states uh, towards their own citizens. So uh, throughout this plenary session, we see this uh, progression of understanding between international health regimes or international uh, health laws and how that regulates vaccines in Mr. Harmon's uh, presentation and how Ms. Robin actually explains that in the form of progressive realization, how we can view uh, vaccines or how we can access vaccines as uh, humans uh, on the basis of vaccine cosmopolitanism. And following that, we see uh, uh, Mr. Rory Akuen and how he translate those main principles on the international scale into the, the domestic uh, competition laws in Indonesia. So I think it was a very fruitful discussion, a very uh, insightful, extremely insightful uh, presentations. And I hope all the participants were able to gain some new knowledge or maybe even interest in this um, realm of law, because I think it's a very important um, study and uh, aspect that I think many more people should be interested in and develop in the future. So on behalf of the Faculty of Law, on behalf of uh, our um, leaders at the Faculty of Law, we would like to um, convey our utmost gratitude for our two guest speakers from Canada and the Netherlands, Mr. Sean Harmon and also Ms. Robin Pierce. Uh, we're very grateful for your um, participation and your delivering of your presentation, despite the time differences that is a bit iffy. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much. We hope that in the future, we can also conduct more uh, cooperation with you guys, maybe um, another presentation, or even we can learn more from you through other methods or means um, between uh, between you personally or even your institution or faculty. So we're looking forward to that opportunity or possibility in the future. Um, with that, uh, I close my responsibility as a moderator uh, for today's plenary session. I apologize if I've said or done anything that may have offended anyone or have made this um, plenary session less um, smooth. Um, I also invite the... <laughs> uh, so... Um,
um, I, well, the, our dean of faculty actually just uh, whispered in my ear that um, he's hoping maybe in the future um, you could uh, bestow your wisdom on maybe other students at the faculty if that's a possibility. And he's very excited towards that possibility. So if that's an opportunity, maybe we can discuss on that. So actually, as I was saying, um, closing my responsibilities as a moderator. Thank you everyone for your participation, orderly participation. Um, I'd also like to invite the guest speakers. Maybe if it's a possibility, you still uh, have some energy left. I know it's a bit late from where you are, but we have um, some paper presentations after this. We have two uh, rooms or two panels. Uh, we invite you, but it's totally okay if <laughs> it's probably time to rest. So thank you for that. Um, I conclude my responsibilities as the moderator today and I give back the floor to Quincy as the MC. Thank you. Yes, okay. Thank you, Agnes, for leading such a fantastic session this morning. And I also want to say thank you for our invited speaker, Mr. Haman, Ms. Pierce, and also Mr. Yuen, for such an insightful presentation this morning. And moving on to our next agenda, we will have a call for paper presentation, but we will have a break for 10 minutes before we start the paper presentation. And for the committee, prepare the room for all participants. In this session, we will have two rooms with very interesting topics, and the committee will assign uh, all participants into the room. So see you in 10 minutes.